Good morning and welcome to the 2021 Colorado Stormwater Symposium. I am Jessica Thrasher. I'm the Education and Outreach Manager for the Colorado Stormwater Center and I will be your moderator for today. I'd like to start by thanking our event sponsors, the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment and the One Water Solutions Institute. If you have any issues today, any technical issues, um, please, you can chat um, Sarah Milanig or send her an email. There she is. Um, and she is going to be our tech support today. And she's also the um, co-organizer for this event. So a big thank you to Sarah. If this is your first event with us, I um, just wanted to introduce you briefly to the Colorado Stormwater Center. I will be speaking in greater detail about um, what we do in session three, but just as a brief introduction, um, the Colorado Stormwater Center's mission is to advance stormwater management throughout Colorado by conducting practical research and providing education and training opportunities. We have a variety of certification courses in addition to trainings and additional classes. We also conduct that research and all of these blue links are all these blue lettering are links. Um, and so once you receive this PowerPoint at the end of today that will be put up on our website, um, you can access each of these links by clicking on them. And we also provide um, resources to really help you um, help you learn about the uh, different videos that you might need and how to um, have the best practices for stormwater management. We also have a monthly newsletter um, that I would invite you to sign up for as well. Some housekeeping items for today. Um, you can put your questions in the chat throughout the sessions today, but we will have Q&A at the end. So we're going to hold all questions to the end, but our presenters or moderators, myself and Sarah, uh, may be answering your questions in the chat um, during, as they come in, um, but we will be asking Q&A um, at the end of the session. At the Q&A, um, please keep yourself muted unless you're asking a question during the Q&A. Um, you are invited to unmute, um, put your video on and ask during that time, but please wait until that specific um, time allotment for that uh, Q&A. If you are wanting to get continuing education credits today, the certified floodplain managers, you will need to answer um, this quiz at the end of each session that you would like to get those credits for. So that will be placed in the chat at the end of each session um, so that you can go to that quiz and fill that out so that we can keep track of who would like to get those continuing education credits. And then we will submit those for you. You can also get continuing education credits for Quell today, and that is just, um, you can just send them that you attended this training and received those credits. Additionally, if you miss any of our sessions today, everything is being recorded and will be added to our website um, by October, um, potentially earlier, but look for those and we will also be sending that out in our newsletters when these sessions are available. Um, we have closed captions available today if, um, to be more inclusive, of course. Um, these, to turn off this setting, if you do not want to see the closed captioning, you can select live transcript at the bottom of your screen and hide subtitle. For today, um, the schedule for today, we're going to start with the fire impacts on water quality. Um, the symposium today was organized to provide a closer look at the effects of natural disasters and extreme climate events, um, specifically fires and floods, and their impact on our water quality. Session one focuses on what is happening now. Once we know what the problems are, we can determine a path forward. As you know, extreme climate events are becoming increasingly more frequent. Session two focuses on what we can do to make our communities more resilient and examples of successful strategies in action. And finally, now that we know what the problems are and what effective strategies exist to increase the resiliency of our communities, we need resources to get started. 
Session three focuses on connecting you to resources available um, to ensure that green infrastructure strategies will be designed and maintained to ensure the long-term success of this infrastructure. In addition, the final session will connect you to free resources to help you determine the best practice, the best path forward for creating resilient, thriving, and equitable communities for future generations. As you can see here, the first session is from nine to 11. We will then have a lunch break from 11 to 12. Um, session two starts at noon and goes until 2 p.m. And then we will have a break um, to stretch or get coffee or snacks from 2 to 2.30. And our final session will be from 2.30 to 4.30. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to invite you to join me for session one. Um, we have a fantastic group of presenters starting today, um, beginning with Daniel Bowker from the Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed. I'd like to now turn it over to Daniel. Thank you, Jessica, really appreciate that. Let me get my screen going here. <clears throat> All right, can you give me a thumbs up if you're seeing everything? All That's right, good. very good. All right, thanks again, Jessica, really appreciate that. And this looks like uh, just an excellent symposium and uh, we are certainly uh, pleased to be invited uh, to talk about the Cameron Peak Fire and I'm gonna cover some of the major fire impacts, uh, the restoration methods, and uh, some of the recovery process that we've been going through. So again, my name is Daniel Bowker. I'm a forester with the Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed. We're a small local nonprofit based in Fort Collins. We're actually 3.75 full-time people right now, uh, small but mighty. But our mission is to improve and maintain the ecological health of the Poudre River watershed through community collaboration. CPRW started after the High Park fire in 2012 and the flooding in 2013 as a way to bring local utilities, agencies, and other nonprofits uh, together to work on post-fire restoration issues. The recovery needs, the post-fire recovery needs from the High Park fire and the flooding pointed to the necessity for additional collaboration to address these post-fire issues. There are several advantages to having a nonprofit in the space of recovery. Uh, some of those are you know, our ability to find funding. Um, we are pretty nimble as far as hiring and all those kinds of things. We have a vast collaborative network um, with the county, with the cities, uh, utility agencies, other nonprofits. Um, U.S. Forest Service, State Forest Service, just a, a, a large collaborative network. That's how we get things done. Um, like I said, we're small, but we have a, a big network. So um, a nonprofit can be really well positioned in this landscape to help to bring people together, to bring the funding together, to talk about the science needs and all that kind of thing, and to get things done, uh, to implement change on the landscape. And so that's what we've been doing um, since 2013. Uh, I actually started with CPRW at the end of 2018, and we were just finishing up our last post-fire restoration project from the High Park Fire and the flooding in 2013. So long-term process, that's for sure. After we completed a bunch of this post-fire restoration work after High Park, we really got into um, pre-fire mitigation and thinking through watershed resilience and how do you make a watershed more resilient to these big stressors like beetle kill and fires and floods and all those kinds of things that we're facing on an increasing scale these days. And so uh, around 2016, we commissioned a large GIS analysis of the Upper Poudre watershed in order to look at the, the Huck 14 level. So those smaller watersheds of, of a few thousand acres and look at those as to several factors, you know, canopy closure and steepness of slopes and uh, roads in there, soil erodibility, um, wildfire risk, all those things to really target these areas that we're going to need resilience work in order to protect us from, you know, fires and floods and those kinds of things. So that's really been my part of CPRW up until the Cameron Peak Fire. 
Uh, I did and still do a lot of uh, uh, pre-fire wildfire mitigation work. So in concert with U.S. Forest Service, with a bunch of other agencies, we look at areas on the landscape where we can multiply the benefits of these mitigation treatments in order to increase resilience of the watershed. Since the High Park fire started, I've been doing a whole lot of post-fire restoration stuff. So it's been a great learning process for me in figuring out kind of that whole cycle. Uh, resilience, fire, and then restoration. And my contact information is there at the bottom. I'm real easy to reach, Daniel at Poudre Watershed. If you'd like to talk about this stuff further, I'd love to get in touch with you. All right, so what's the problem? These forests burn. Um, so why are they burning differently now? Well, there's all kinds of reasons for that. And I think some of our other presenters will go into more detail on some of these dynamics. But the big problem is that there's been a change in our wildfire patterns. We are having very large, very intense wildfires, uh, stand replacing, uh, crown killing wildfires that have changed the way uh, that water moves through our landscapes. We've, you know, these areas where we lose the canopy, uh, we lose the um, soil cover, we lose um, the organic layer and we get major changes in the hydrology after wildfire. And those are huge impacts to our watershed benefits, things like our um, water infrastructure, our intakes, our reservoirs, those kinds of things, uh, impacts to our communities, impacts to uh, infrastructure like roads and homes and things like that. So that's kind of the basics. Wildfires are bigger, they're more intense. They're also becoming more frequent, and this has huge impacts to our watershed and the benefit received from our forested watershed. This is a pretty sobering statistic here, several of them. Uh, up until, well, in 2002, we had the Hayman fire, which is the, the, was the largest in Colorado history until we got to 2020. And then since then, we've had four bigger than that just last year, uh, which is really kind of amazing. Of course, the Mullen fire started and burned mostly in Wyoming, but also burned down into Colorado and threatened for a bit to join uh, the East Troublesome and, and Cameron Peak fires there. Um, so yes, fires are getting larger, they're getting more frequent, and they're burning just a vast area of our watershed and our landscape. The Cameron Peak fire started on August 13, 2020. Uh, just a year ago now, uh, there have been a few events lately to, um, to commemorate the beginning of this fire. Uh, it started in the upper Poudre watershed near Cameron Pass, uh, between Cameron Peak and Chambers Lake. And so you can, I think you can see my pointer. If not, um, the, the red area there, that's where the fire started. Um, they're still technically investigating, officially investigating the cause of the fire. A lot of uh, signs point to human caused in some way. Um, but that to me is sort of beside the point. A fire was going to start at some point somewhere. That's just what these forests do. And the conditions that we have now, very dense, uh, overgrown forests, lots of stress, lots of beetle kill, um, lots of areas that are prone to burn. So a fire was going to start. This one was much different from the High Park fire in that it started very high up in the watershed. So pretty much at the top of the watershed, up around 10,000 feet. Uh, the forest there is different um, from the High Park fire area. High Park really burned in the Ponderosa Pine, dry mixed conifer forest type. Uh, the Cameron Peak fire started up in the Lodgepole Pine and even in some spruce fir up near Cameron Pass. So a little different dynamics there. And if you know that area, you know that that area has been very dense for a very long time. There's a lot of beetle kill, both spruce and lodgepole pine in those areas. So it was really primed for a large fire. And something that was very, again, sobering to all of us uh, that were working on this incident was that as soon as this started, we're talking within a few days of the fire starting, we had a pretty good idea that this was gonna be the big one in that part of the watershed. Um, early estimates and early, you know, looking at those contingency lines from the Forest Service, how they're gonna fight this fire. Um, they drew a big box around this thing and it was a 180 or thousand or so acres, which really surprised a lot of people. People thought, are you gonna let this thing burn all those acres? Well, no, they weren't gonna let it burn. This was a full suppression fire. They jumped right on it and tried to stop it but they knew that it was gonna be really hard to get firefighters in 
this timber type, this fuel type, and do uh, much good, you know, right ag up against this fire. And so they knew that that it was eventually going to um, potentially, potentially get large. They tried everything they could to slow it down. And this fire was really dominated by a couple big runs. Um, so between September 4th and September 7th over Labor Day weekend, uh, the fire grew over 78,000 acres. And you can really see that on this map here. So, you know, it had started around that Cameron Peak area and started burning up into the Laramie River Valley, kind of down towards Chambers Lake, uh, that kind of thing. And then we had some really hot, dry, windy conditions uh, that made this thing run over 78,000 acres over the Labor Day weekend. I actually just on a personal note, I'd taken my daughter up to the Sierra Madre up near Encampment, Wyoming, and we could see the fire blow up from there. Um, from 100 miles away over a mountain range. You could see that smoke. And then as we were coming back down through Laramie on the 7th, uh, I, I thought Fort Collins had burned down myself. It was, it was just phenomenal. I'm sure you guys experienced a lot of the same thing. Another big run happened uh, between October 13th and 19th when the fire reached around 200,000 acres. And this burned uh, really kind of pushed over Pinnock Pass into the Buckhorn watershed, into the Buckhorn Creek area, which is the Big Thompson watershed. So a lot of this fire was in the Poudre watershed, some in the Laramie River, and then this big run really pushed a lot of this fire down into the Big Thompson watershed. And again, you know, fire dynamics like these are really dominated by those hot, dry, windy conditions. The fire might you know, expand some and then sit there for a while, and then you get that really intense, low humidity, high wind day, and this is what it does. And so you will notice one thing on this map here. If you, again, I don't know if you can see my pointer, I apologize if you can. Uh, but just to the east of the fire on the left-hand map, you'll see that there's a, a, it's not as green. And then you look right below that and it's a lot greener. Well, what happened in that area to the east of the fire? That was the High Park Fire Scar from 2012. And so what happened with this fire, it burned, you know, it was burning west to east following the winds. It burned into the high part fire scar, and then it didn't really have anywhere to go because that fuel had been reduced, but that wind pushed it over uh, Pinnock Pass and it found a way down into that green timber, um, down into that area in the Buckhorn, Big Thompson watershed. So the fire was finally 100% contained on December 2nd after burning for 112 days, 208,913 acres and finally declared controlled on January 12th. So the extent and um, the, the duration is really what is different about this fire. Um, lodgepole pine, spru even spruce fir, it burns this way. It burns in these big stand replacing fires, uh, but it normally doesn't burn for 112 days and over this large an extent. And that is a relic of um, forest management, forest health, and climate change, those things are all coming together uh, to create the conditions that we have now for these major fires. So some of the major impacts here, a 325 mile fire perimeter. Now it didn't burn every acre within that perimeter, uh, but that's just huge. And when you think about, you know, what do we do for restoration and recovery from a fire like this? Uh, burned 1,050 stream miles, 124 trail miles, about 42,000 acres of wilderness. 32 miles of wild and scenic river. The Cache Poudre is Colorado's only wild and scenic river corridor. Burned 32 miles of that. Three watersheds, the Poudre, the Big Thompson, the Laramie River Valley. Five uh, high elevation water storage reservoirs. And this is a big impact. Um, this is something that's a little different from High Park. You know, it burned high up in the watershed. All of our water storage uh, eggs are kind of all in that same basket up there. And a lot of that area burned. At least 16 mountain communities were impacted, almost 500 structures. So a huge fire, huge acreage, huge extent. What do you do about this? Well, you bring together pretty much anybody that can help. And um, this is a slightly blurry and very busy slide, but it gives you an idea of how many agencies and organizations and just how many folks were involved in this. So we've got fire response and communication, recovery planning, uh, collaboration, fundraising, public communications, monitoring, project prioritization, public assistance, future planning, uh, a huge undertaking for all of these agencies to come together and figure out how to um, come to some sort of structure and, and figure out what to do about recovery. 
Um, CPRW played a major role in the early days. Uh, within 10 days of the fire starting, um, what do you need to do when you get that many people together during a pandemic? Well, you start organizing a whole lot of really big Zoom meetings. And we did that two, three times a week, sometimes five times a day to get all these people just together. And, and that's what it really takes is to get all these people together talking about priorities and implementation and what do we do where. Uh, that was one of our major roles at the very beginning was just bringing all these people together. Came up with this recovery team structure. Uh, this is the, the county, uh, Larimer County structure for how we were going to deal with all this. We had a water recovery group, infrastructure, public health, individual needs, community support, mitigation and resilience, economic health, data and information, planning and building. A lot more to a fire than just getting the mud off the road and uh, after the floods and, and uh, you know, uh, figuring out where the projects are. There's a whole lot to this. CPRW played a, a main role in the water recovery work group. And there we've been doing things like science and monitoring, modeling and analysis, infrastructure, uh, water infrastructure, damages and repair, uh, hill slope, channel and forest rehabilitation, uh, and grants and fundraising has been one of our major roles. It's just finding the money to do this kind of work. Let's see, there we go. And so the recovery process, uh, it's really at the beginning, it's opportunistic. What can we do right now? Uh, what is going to be an exigent need uh, coming up? What's kind of that medium term? We can wait till, you know, fall or something like that to do these things. And what, what is long-term recovery? Like over five years. And I mentioned that, you know, when I started in 2018 with CPRW, we were still dealing with the effects of the High Park Fire from 2012 and 2013. So you got to plan, prioritize, and then implement on that kind of scale. There we go. So what are some of the long-term impacts uh, from these major wildfires and the floods that inevitably follow? Well, altered watershed processes. So the hydrograph is going to change. Uh, you don't have that slow infiltration. You don't have the sponge of the forest floor in a lot of these areas. You don't have that forest canopy that's going to slow down the raindrops before they hit that bare soil and ash. So you're going to get a lot of excess sediment and nutrients. You're going to get debris flows, flash floods, washed out roads, water quality issues, uh, turning off the intake uh, for water supplies for both Fort Collins and Greeley. That's already happened this year. And so we've already seen some of these scenes of black water coming down the pooter. Um, so, so those are some of the long-term impacts. We're going to go into a lot more detail on some of the other presenters here today on um, the dynamics of those. But these are the things that we're trying through the recovery process to figure out where they're going to happen. And again, take that humongous 208,000 acre, 325 mile perimeter fire and figure out where we can put money, time, and people uh, in order to implement some recovery. So this is really um, a combination of, for the camera peak and any fire, uh, the burn severity of the fire, got to figure that out. The topography, uh, you know, the landscape where it burned, soil type, erodibility, that kind of thing, and rainfall intensity, projected rainfall intensity, is all together is really going to equal your uh, degree of impact in these burned areas. Starting with soil burn severity, this is from the BEAR report, our Burn Area Emergency Response Report uh, that the Forest Service and Natural Resources Conservation Service completed uh, right after the fire. And what you can see here, green is unburned, uh, yellow is low severity, orange is moderate severity, and high is high severity fire. Moderate and high severity fire, are uh, those are the areas that we really are concerned with. Low severity fire uh, really does leave some of the root structure and some of that stuff on the ground. And so you're not going to see as high of an impact in those low severity areas. But for this fire, 208,000 acres, about 77,000 acres were moderate to high burn severity, over a third of the fire area. So again, just a, a huge area to try to think about what do we do and how do we do it. And you can see some, um, you know, some of the areas where so soil burn severity is really a, a function of how fast and how intense that fire burn is. So in some of the areas where the fire sat and burned longer, we have higher burn severity. Up in the areas around Chambers Lake where it started, uh, the area around Pingree Park and 
south fork of the Cachalapooter where it kind of sat and burned for a while before it blew down into the Big Thompson. You also see some interesting things in the Big Thompson area, uh, kind of the boot that's coming out there into the Big Thompson. You see some larger, less um, defined polygons. That was because there was snow cover. Uh, there was some snow cover on this fire while they were still trying to figure out uh, the burned, uh, the soil burn severity. And so there's some areas that weren't as uh, tightly defined just because there was already snow cover in areas of the fire. Then we look at post-fire sediment yield. This is uh, work done by the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute. This looked at those, again, those smaller watersheds like the Huck 14 level watersheds and looked at them as far as what their risk was. Um, are, are they highly erodible? Are there areas of uh, potential debris flow sediment yield in there? And then the high reward watersheds, where are the areas where that are already high risk, where we can put money and time and implement some restoration measures that will be high reward. And so that modeling was done. We came up with 30 uh, high reward watersheds based on potential reductions in erosion per unit area, um, thinking about wood tread mulch treatments on, on these areas. Of course, you can't do it all. So we have to figure out you know, which ones are gonna be those highest reward areas to treat. Debris flows were also modeled. Uh, this was done by the USGS. Um, what you can expect according to USGS in some of these areas uh, is that areas that flood or that had debris flows pre-fire will have larger magnitude events. Uh, areas that occasionally flooded or had debris flows uh, pre-fire will see more frequent events, and areas that previously did not have any of these things might have them now. And so that's what you're seeing on this map. The darker colors are the areas uh, that are more at risk of debris flow, and this is based on a 15-minute, uh, 24 millimeter an hour rainfall. And we've already seen some of that. Of course, the, the tragic events, uh, July 21st in Black Hollow. Um, the, the debris flow that happened there. And I think some of our other presenters will go um, more deeply into some of these dynamics here, but that was just an area that had very high burn severity, high in the watershed. It's a large watershed, drains down through a very tight canyon before it hits the river. And, you know, this just the legacy of human development over the past 100, 120 years in this area we put our structures on the flat zones and the flat zones were pretty much those debris fans from, from previous flooding and uh, events like this. So this is what happened here. Three people lost their lives, one is still missing and presumed dead and six homes were destroyed there. So uh, a really tough event for all of us who have been working to, to mitigate uh, things like this. So you put all that together and you get a full fire scale uh, prioritization analysis, basically. So this assessment, this was done by JW Associates, a consulting firm out of Summit County, uh, looked at the zones of concern, the post-fire watershed hazards and potential treatments to minimize the effects and target locations for those treatments. Again, 77,000 acres of moderate to high burn severity. How do you target these areas? Well, you put all those factors together, soil burn severity, erosion potential, debris flow hazard, Composite roads, how many forest roads are in these areas. Um, forest roads can definitely uh, catch and channel a bunch of debris. And then we get a numerical ranking for all these Huck 14 watersheds uh, from one to five based on the composite hazard ranking there. And so we have 34 small watersheds uh, that received a highest post-fire hazard ranking. Those are the ones, in, um, what should we call that? Fuchsia maybe, uh, the kind of the uh, bright purple there. Uh, those are the areas that we can really expect to see uh, the major impacts and that we are targeting for treatments. So what in the world can you do? Well, one thing you can do is drop mulch from helicopters. And that is something that has been done uh, throughout the West before. There's good information on the effectiveness of this treatment. So CPRW uh, hired a post-fire project manager to uh, implement this treatment with money from City of Fort Collins and City of Greeley through the NRCS in, um, excuse me, Emergency Watershed Protection Program, uh, the Colorado Water Conservation Board, and the uh, Community Foundation in Northern Colorado, No Coast Fire Fund is where a lot of this money is coming from. We hired a project manager to do this and to figure out the logistics. This is an intense process. It's a GIS analysis of figuring out uh, you know, which of those areas can be mulched 
finding the landing zones within a mile of the site, getting those approved from the Forest Service or private lands, and then an actual on the ground analysis, what I was doing yesterday up in Roaring Creek. Uh, you get on the ground and you say, okay, this area is actually revegetated some, it doesn't need mulch, or it's too steep, or it's too rocky, or, you know, we can adjust these boundaries and say, yes, this is an area that need mul needs mulch. Approve that on the front end, the helicopters come in and drop the mulch, then we go out afterwards and do transects and make sure it's got that 70% coverage and hits the polygon that we asked them to hit, and if not, they come back and do it. And so that's the idea here is to really mitigate these negative consequences of the wildfire, um, including, th including values like water quality and supply, ecosystem function and health, and reducing flood impacts. We identified more than 10,000 high priority acres in the Poudre watershed and 1,500 acres in the Big T, uh, based on all the factors that we were looking at earlier. And that mulch is to provide a physical barrier basically to the rainfall. Uh, to slow things down, help it infiltrate, uh, kind of mimic that forest floor that has been lost. So this is this is an example map from one of the areas that we were working uh, on week two. And so again, over 10,000 high priority acres were identified. This is outside of wilderness where we can't drop uh, mulch. Um, this was also uh, quite a negotiation with some of the federal programs. The EWP money is intended to be spent on private lands we were able to get, um, get that spent on public lands, on federal lands, and use that money for, for this aerial mulching process. So far, well, not so far. By the end of the season, we think we'll get about 5,500 acres and spend about $12 million. So it's not cheap, but it's our only real opportunity to treat thousands of acres of this fire. The other things we can do are an acre at a time or even a quarter acre at a time. Things like wattles, seeding, mulching, check dams, a lot of folks have been involved in this, uh, the Larimer County Conservation Corps, WRV, Wildlands Restoration Volunteers, the Big Thompson Coalition, CPRW, landowner groups. This is uh, intense, labor intensive, um, slow work, but it's also very effective. Some of those check dams I've seen after flood events and after rains, that they're pretty amazing, uh, the way they can slow down some of the water and debris and ash. And so these are intended to slow that stuff down in headwater areas to protect downstream water quality. Again, expensive and slow, um, but very effective in those, those points where we need to do it. There's also been a lot of work on debris removal, structure protection. Um, Greeley and Larimer County have coordinated that life and property protection, and that is usually lower in the watersheds near and around those communities and structures that are at the, at the bottom of those watersheds and debris removal from a lot of the areas uh, that were burned. So back to this map, challenges ahead. You know, 5,500 acres is about what we're gonna get this year for aerial mulch, which is awesome, but it's not 77,000. Um, so there are a lot of areas where we're still going to need to be doing things, uh, whether that's aerial mulch or these on the ground treatments. We're really thinking about as the rains come and these things revegetate and things shift around, where are those channel treatments that we're gonna to have to start thinking about. Things like reconnecting streams to floodplains, uh, wet meadow restoration, beaver habitat, those kind of things that are you know, also increasing resilience against uh, wildfires uh, that, that may come. But there's a lot left to do. Uh, it takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of collaboration. That's one of the things CPRW has really been trying to do is increase both of those. And then I wanna end with thinking about this entire cycle. Wildfire mitigation, a lot of what I do uh, in uh, concert with the Northern Colorado Fire Shift Collaborative. This is everybody in Northern Colorado that's working on wildfire mitigation. We have to think about increasing the resilience of our forests to these types of events, especially in the face of climate change. Then there's going to be fire, whether uh, wildfire or prescribed fire. And then we have to think about the recovery. So it's, it's a cycle of mitigation, fire and recovery. And funding, I mentioned NRCS, EWP program, CWCB, Fort Collins and Greeley Community Foundation, uh, all those have put in, um, you know, altogether millions of dollars for this process. I think I'll leave it there. That's pretty much my 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel, for that fantastic overview. Um, and I also have a few more announcements to make before we have our next speaker, which is Dr. Stephanie Camp. Um, I would like to acknowledge our sponsor for this session, which is Northern Water. Um, thank you so much to Northern Water. Um, we also have a partnership 
with Colorado WaterWise for this for session one. Um, and so Northern Water enabled uh, free access for some of the Colorado WaterWise um, participants to attend today, um, since all of Colorado WaterWise events are free. Um, at the Colorado Stormwater Center, we're looking to increase our partnerships, and that is how we get the word out about these training opportunities. Um, so just wanna thank both of you for partnering with us for our event today. Again, thank you so much to Daniel for our great opening presentation, and I would like to turn it over to Dr. Stephanie Camp. All right, thank you. Um, so I'll build a little bit on some of the topics that Daniel discussed and focus really on the stormwater issues that are associated with fire. See if I can get my slide to advance. So Daniel mentioned how big 2020 was in terms of fire impacts. And so this is just looking at the, that information in a different way. This is the area covered by fires over time in Colorado. And you can see the big fire years of 2002 2012 was a big year here on the Front Range when we had the High Park Fire and Waldo Canyon Fire and others. But 2020 just really um, blew all of those out of the water. It was just an incredible year, really big fires. We wanna look that, at that on a map. All these orange areas are the prior fires prior to 2020. So here you can see the High Park Fire, there's the Hayman Fire, and then here we've got the fires that happened in 2020. So the Cameron Peak fire up here right next to the High Park fire, the East Troublesome fire, the Mullen fire up over in Wyoming, the Pine Gulch fire, the Grizzly Creek fire here that's caused so much problem, so many problems on I-70. So it was just a really tremendous year for fires. Another unique fact about the 2020 fires in Colorado is that they, at least here in the Front Range, burned at quite high elevation. So this is a little bit of a small map. Um, now you're seeing the prior fires, black dots. So here's the Hayman Fire, the High Park Fire, um, in the Southern Rockies ecoregion. And if you look at the orange colors and the sort of reddish colors, those are all places with relatively low amounts of snow. And then the bluer colors are places with more snow. And so what you can notice with the Cameron Peak fire is that it covered an area that really has a lot more snow than what we've seen in previous fires. And so we expect the snow influence to be a bigger deal in the Cameron Peak and East Troublesome fires as, as compared to other fires that we've experienced in the past. Here's just a photo of the Chambers Lake area. So that's near where Daniel showed that the um, Cameron Peak fire had started. And so this is just as snow was beginning to accumulate after the fire. This area retains snowpack for a good share of the year. So for much of the year, that snow is on the ground preventing erosion from happening, but then all of that snow melts into the ground in the spring. And so creates really wet conditions up in these areas. Generally, we think about post-fire stormwater problems as being a rainfall dominated. And so um, for creating high stormwater problems with fire, there's a combination of factors that are important. So if the ground cover burns, then you end up having low surface roughness. So there's not much to slow down the stormwater. Sometimes you can have high hydrophobicity after fire and that can reduce the amount of water that infiltrates. And so if you combine those conditions with high rainfall intensity, then you can get overland flow developing on the surface and that overland flow can get rapidly into streams, um, creating flash flood problems. So because the water is traveling so rapidly, these streams can rise and fall within, this, within the space of less than an hour. Sometimes it's just a few minutes when they're rising. So here you can see an example of a stream that's usually just a leap across or even a step across and just rapidly filled with stormwater after the High Park fire. Typically, we see these kinds of responses during the first two years post-fire. So the year of the fire being year zero and then year, the couple years after that. Um, then the responses stop being so flashy because the ground has recovered. And so you don't see as much of that overland flow and lack of infiltration. These are triggered by 
relatively low rainfall intensities early on post fire. So only a, a couple tenths of an inch um, of inches per hour um, can trigger these kind of flood response. This image is showing you the state of Colorado in each different panel. I realize the text is a little bit hard to read, but it's showing the estimated number of times that we would experience events, rainfall events of particular intensities. So at that lower end of intensities that might trigger a post-fire flood or, or flashy response, four millimeters per hour, we might experience on the front range those kind of events eight to 10 times per year. Whereas as you go to higher intensity, so eight millimeters per hour, for example, that might be only a two or three times per year type of storm. And so, you know, the higher the intensity, the less likely that we'll experience that storm, but certainly most summers are going to have storms that can trigger this kind of stormwater response in burned areas. This is an example from the High Park fire, giving an idea of what these hydrographs look like. So how during these summer rainstorms do the streams respond? So we're gonna see these kind of stormwater responses mostly in small tributary streams. So what you're looking at here is a stream called Skin Gulch that was in the High Park fire. And Skin Gulch is about a 15 kilometer squared or six mile square watershed. And this is a series of different summer rainfall events that were um, not very big, so 10 to 18 millimeters or 0.4 to 0.7 inches total. The first one, you can see that there is high intensity rainfall followed by a quick rise in the hydrograph. And then what tends to happen during these events is that the stream will change. Um, so oftentimes you'll see that the streams aggrade, so they fill up with sediment after the storm event. And that's because the rainfall is so quick. And so the streams quickly respond. And then as they decline, they just dump all that sediment that they're carrying. And so they tend to fill up with sediment. It doesn't always happen. So here you see this next event, August 23rd. And so the stream responded quickly and it didn't, it had kind of a little slower, more gradual decline. So it didn't actually fill up with sediment. And then in this third one, it actually cut into some of that sediment that was in the bed. So lots of different complex responses can happen in these streams. If you were around the Front Range in 2013, you know about the 2013 floods. So that was an interesting feature that happened after the High Park fire. So unusually, we had a 10 inch, depending on where you were, it might've been even larger, but for the High Park fire areas, about 10 inches of rainfall, um, over the course of a, several days that really profoundly changed the streams throughout the area and certainly within the High Park fire. And so here you're seeing that same stream that I had shown on the left and all the rainfall that was coming in during this really big September storm. And what happened in this part of Skin Gulch is that the stream responded and it just filled up with sediment. So upstream, this uh, the water was actually carving into the channel, really incising it quite deeply. And where we had a sensor downstream, that sediment was just filling up because it was a flat area. There was a culvert downstream that had gotten blocked and it just filled right up with sediment. This is another watershed right here, Hill Gulch of the same size that didn't have as dramatic as a response, but it also filled up a bit with sediment during that 2013 storm. If you move to a larger river basin, so this is the, the Castle Pooter, so now we're looking at a few thousand kilometers squared as opposed to um, just 15 kilometers squared. And so the Pooter normally has a snowmelt dominated hydrograph. This would be the snowmelt peak. And then these little spikes are just those rain events where I showed you the hydrograph and the small streams. So they don't have a huge impact on the Pooter relative to snowmelt but they do cause it to rise and fall. And those will be times when there'll be high turbidity within the Poudre River. And then again, quite unusually, that September 2013 event produced really high flow in the Poudre, even exceeding, far exceeding the snowmelt peak, which is quite, just quite unusual. So what's happening in the Cameron Peak fire? We're seeing pretty similar responses. We've actually seen some substantial rainfalls this year. So here is the first one where, at least in the areas that um, 
our research team is monitoring where we saw some big rainfall impacts. So the places that you're looking at here are Dry Creek and Washout Gulch. They're highlighted in a circle. Um, this was a June 25th event. It was about 1.2 inches, um, but these all of these storms are quite variable. So this is just 1.2 inches where we had a rain gauge. And you can see that the rain came in two pulses. The first pulse actually had the biggest response. So Dry Creek quickly rose, quickly declined. And the second pulse, not quite as much, it rose and fell. Washout Gulch is here in yellow and it's not as heavily burned. And so it just kind of had a little gentle rise, but not a big spiky, flashy rise and fall. This is what the sensors look like after that happened. So um, stream is usually just again, a leap across stream, but then the flashy response comes within the space of a few minutes, the stream rises all the way up. In this case, it rose over, to the, over the top of the sensors build them in with sediment, and so you can see this sediment marking as it comes right back down. All of that happens very quickly. Uh, Daniel already mentioned the Black Hollow, the really destructive event that happened in July. So I'm showing you here where Black Hollow is. So these are the previous two watersheds I'd shown you, Dry Creek and Washout Gulch. Black Hollow is quite a bit bigger than those two, and it it's, has really substantially large areas with high burn severity, which is in the red. Um, now, if we look at the rainfall totals here, I realize this is a little bit small to see, but Black Hollow is right, outlets right here in the X. So we're in the blue colors for the rain, estimated rainfall totals there. We don't have a rain gauge within the watershed, but we're looking at about an inch of rain. So this is actually not a big difference in the amount of rain. In fact, it's quite similar to the previous event I showed you in Dry Creek, where the stream rose and fell and caused some damage, but nothing compared to the amount of destruction shown in Black Hollow. So what's going on in Black Hollow? Um, notice that here's the shape of the watershed and it's got these high burn severity areas toward the top of it. And there's also Cran Point Road going across the top. So if we look at that road area, what you can see is that there are some flow paths coming down off of there. So these, this a lot of overland flow coming off of the upper watershed off of these high burn severity areas and then accumulating in these drainages. What's interesting about this watershed is that each of these tributaries is converging. So they're all kind of just coming into a central, a central point. So um, there's a lot of convergence of flow in this watershed, which contributes to it being um, quite destructive during the flood. As you go further downstream where the channel kind of gets um, penned in a little bit more, you can continue to see all of these tracks of flow coming down. In some cases, the flow is um, actually debris flows and carrying a quite a large amount of sediment, some of which gets into the stream, some of which fans out and deposits on the bottom. And this is going even a little bit further down. Again, here you can see tracks where debris was coming down into the watershed and then you can see how it's really penned in at the bottom. And so all of that convergence of places that were generating flow, as well as all the sediment that was coming down at the same Watershed. Now we're looking up here near where the fire started um, to see what happened. And what we can see is here, the two high elevation watersheds are in orange and in green, and then the pooter is in blue. So that first rain event that I showed you in Dry Creek had a little bit of a response at high elevation, but nothing very large. The next one, the Black Hollow, not much response at high elevation, but it did have a pretty substantial impact on the pooter. But then on 2nd of August, we had a big response at high elevation. Kind of, again, a surprisingly large response given that it was seemed to be only less than an inch of rainfall, but a very large response. And so there are some streams that showed some big impacts as a result of that rain event. So here I'm showing one that's a little bit 
further downstream from where we've got the stream stage sensors, but you can see all the debris that has been moved down from that rain event. Okay, so this is a review of the rainfall runoff idea that we've got this fast kind of response. It tends to happen late June into September. It's really spatially variable, just depends on where those high intensity bursts of rain fall. Um, and the flood damage is not a function of just the, the rainfall dynamics and the burn severity alone. There's a sediment dynamic piece that becomes very important, how that sediment moves through, whether it block, blocks flow and creates additional flood damage. Snow melt runoff is um, perhaps less of a concern in terms of extreme damage, but it does cause some changes in the post-fire environment. One thing that we noticed quite a bit during Cameron Peak Fire is that there was still a fair amount of hydrophobicity in the soil as the snow was melting. And so we saw quite a bit of ponded water and some flow paths that were developing um, near the surface in places where we hadn't seen them before, as well as some sediment moving around. And so that seemed to have led to earlier and flashier response in the burned streams. And so here you're seeing an unburned stream that kind of took a little bit of time to respond and it's a little bit more gradual than a burn stream, which started responding to that snow melt earlier and kind of had a larger response. We're still looking at those um, streams. It'll take a little bit of time to understand the differences in the burned and unburned watersheds, but we're generally seeing that earlier flashier response to burned watersheds. This is happening mostly in April through June. It hasn't changed the channels at nearly as much as the rain events, um, but it has, it did cause some incision in some of the larger streams. Perhaps the largest impact that we noticed is that during the snowmelt, new streams appeared or streams were, that we hadn't seen activate for the amount of time that we've been measuring over the past 10 years or so. So here's an example of one that appeared and flowed for several weeks during snowmelt and then kind of settled down, regrew with grass during early summer, and then has now become a flash flood corridor. And so it's a place that just, when there's rain, it just flows and brings a lot of sediment with it. So Daniel already talked about mitigation. Um, so mitigation is in, in, important when we're dealing with these really substantial impacts. He covered mulching, and I'll say a little bit more about that. And we also have to be concerned about what's happening downstream. So how can we control all this drainage and sediment that's moving around? We know that mulch does reduce surface erosion. So in the High Park fire, comparing mulched and unmulched hill slopes, you can see that the mulched hill slopes had substantially less surface erosion. Um, so this would be the sediment yield from hill slopes. And we're hoping to learn more during this fire about the effect that mulch has on overland flow and runoff generation. The mulch is really most effective during the first year um, or potentially first two years post fire. But after that, when vegetation grows back, then mulch is no longer needed because the vegetation is, is doing even better than what the mulch could do. It, it's got roots in place and it's giving ground cover. Drainage control is also an important piece. Um, and so there's been a lot of work throughout the High Park fire and Cameron Peak fire on culvert enlargements. So those culverts need to be large enough to pass not only the higher storm water, but also the substantial amount of debris logs that um, may be moving around in these streams post fire. And then of course, we cannot control all of these responses. They're too quick, too big. And so emergency response and flood warning systems are really important. Both City of Fort Collins and Larimar County have great um, flood warning systems in place and gauges throughout these burned areas. So to summarize, um, compared to unburned areas, it takes lower rainfall intensity to trigger flash floods. These are happening mostly in late June to September in convective thunderstorms. Um, and their responses are affected by burn severity, the shape of the water, shed as well as how sediment dynamics move around, um, are moving through these streams. Snow melt runoff is important to consider. It's not cause, causing those flashy response, but it is changing stream flow. It's happening earlier in the year. And it's creating, at least in the Cameron 
peak fire, it created some new streams that later have become flash flood corridors. Mitigation tools that I've mentioned include mulching, some drainage and sediment control, and warning systems. So thank you for having me. That's all I have, and I can turn it over to the next. Thank you very much, Dr. Camp, um, giving us that overview of, of how fires impact water quality and quantity. Um, I'd like to invite our next presenter um, to come up, Maggie Spangler, um, the Associate Water Quality Engineer for Northern Water. Maggie. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, hi, I'm Maggie Spangler, and I work for Northern Water, and I'll be talking to you today about the impacts on water quality post-fire. And specifically, I'm going to be talking about the East Troublesome Fire and the effects it has on our water delivery system. Uh, before I go any further, I really want to recognize uh, just how much watershed recovery is a team effort. Uh, Northern's working with a bunch of really wonder wonderful entities to implement restoration projects and collect a lot of really amazing data to help us know what's going on in the um, East Charleston Fire Burn Scar. We're also receiving a lot of funding from the Colorado Water Conservation Board and NRCS. Uh, so today I'm just going to start by talking a little bit about what Northern Water does. I'm going to describe the water flow in our West Slope system. I'm going to give a brief overview of the East Troublesome Fire. Uh, and then I'm going to kind of just briefly touch on the aspects of fire that affect water delivery. And then we'll go specifically into infrastructure effects and then look at some data from Willow Creek Reservoir and see what the water quality effects have been so far uh, this summer. And then I'll briefly touch on recovery and source water protection at the end. So Northern Water. Northern Water jointly operates the Colorado Big Thompson project with the Bureau of Reclamation. And so what we do is we deliver the raw water as, supplement as a supplemental water supply, including municipal, agricultural, industrial, and domestic water users. Our service area is 1.6 million acres over eight, eight counties in the Front Range, and we provide water for 615,000 acres of irrigated land. And we serve over 1 million residents in the Front Range. So this is our, our West Slope system, and we collect water in the West Slope system, and then we send it over to the East Slope for distribution. And the way that water flows in this system when we're not pumping is uh, we have a few other inlets that come in, but kind of mainly what we talk about is the Colorado River, and it flows from north to south into Shadow Mountain Reservoir and water then flows into Grandview Reservoir where it is consistently released into the Colorado River where it flows into Windy Gap Reservoir and then downstream. Uh, and then we also have Willow Creek Reservoir which is released into Willow Creek which flows into the Colorado River and then that goes into Windy Gap Reservoir. So we have this far pump plant in Grandview Reservoir and when we turn that on, we uh, start to pump water from Grandview Reservoir to Shadow Mountain Reservoir. And this effectively uh, reverses the gradient of the Colorado River. So we have water flow from Grandview Reservoir to Shadow Mountain Reservoir through Grand Lake and then through the Adams Tunnel where it goes under the mountains and comes out near Estes Park. Um, and then what happens is it goes through hydroelectric plants and then into our East Slope distribution system. Um, when the fire pump plant is on, everything downstream of Granby Reservoir uh, flows as it did when it was just native flow. So we also have Willow Creek and Windy Gap Reservoir pumps. And so this uh, pumps water from Willow Creek Reservoir and Windy Gap Reservoir into Granby Reservoir. And these can pump um, regardless of whether or not the fire pump plant is uh, pumping and then, yeah, we always consistently have water releasing from Granby um, down into the Colorado River. And then also water is always going from, uh, or through Windy Gap Reservoir and then is always being released into co the Colorado River. So we saw that just now our collection system and this figure shows just how our collection system is positioned pretty much just downstream of the East Troublesome Fire Burn Scar. And many of our watersheds are within the 
these shovels and fire burn scar. So these shovels and fire burned 193,559 acres. And this was in October of 2020. Uh, it started really intensely in that we had 100,000 acres burn overnight on October 22nd. There were 17 miles of growth in 90 minutes. Uh, there were hurricane force winds, 589 structures were burned, and there were 4,000 evacuees. Uh, so Stephanie and Daniel did a really great job of talking about the effects of fire on water quality and uh, hill slopes. Uh, and the way that that specifically affects our system is that this increased sediment and debris mobility uh, basically comes into our water uh, and it can bring with it, you know, just sediment in general and debris, but also, as I think Daniel mentioned, it brings nutrients, which can cause algal blooms and other issues within water bodies. Uh, the other aspect that's relevant to our system is the increased flooding and flashiness of runoff because we kind of, since we're managing water flows, we have to pay attention to what's coming into our system. So specifically, uh, for kind of the effects on infrastructure, what happens is when there's high amounts of sediment in the water, it can damage the infrastructure. So if water with high sediment is going through hydroelectric turbines, it can uh, really degrade those turbines and cause a lot of issues. It can also cause problems in pumps, and then it can also clog pipelines and tunnels that the water is going through. Uh, one thing that we have already seen this summer is we had a temporary reduced Adams tunnel capacity because the trash rack got clogged with sediment. Uh, also, hot sulfur springs, although it's, it's not in our system, it's downstream of Windy Gap Reservoir. Uh, they had, to, and they're also downstream of a lot of the East Troublesome Fire burn scar. They had to turn off their water intake because the turbidity was too high and they couldn't treat the water. Uh, so when we see these infrastructure effects, uh, it really reduces the flexibility of our system because suddenly we can't send water one place or another because it could cause damage to the infrastructure. So one way that we are looking at the effects of the fire on our system and on water quality is we have a really wonderful surface water quality monitoring program. And it's been going on for a really long time, so it's well established, and we have a really robust baseline data set. So we'll be able to compare, you know, what data looks like post fire to what it looked like pre fire and kind of see what's happening. Additionally, as part of this program, we have a lot of uh, real time sensors that are sending us data so that we can see, okay, there's, there's high turbidity here, you know, wh what can we do? where are we sending the water? Um, so today we're just gonna look at some data in the Willow Creek watershed. And you can see down here, this little reservoir is Willow Creek Reservoir. And if you look at the watershed, you can see that the majority of it was burned by these troublesome fire. So the sites we'll be looking at specifically are Willow Creek upstream of the reservoir and Willow Creek Dam. So at Willow Creek upstream of the reservoir, we have real-time data that's maintained by the USGS. And what we're gonna look at today is discharge precipitation and turbidity to kind of see what are the effects of precipitation on discharge and turbidity going into Willow Creek Reservoir. We also have grab samples at the Willow Creek Dam site that were uh, taken by the USGS. And we're gonna look at some nutrients. So that includes nitrate plus nitrite, total Kjeldahl nitrogen, which I will call TKN because it's difficult to say, uh, orthophosphate, and then total phosphorus. And these nutrients are important to look at because uh, nutrients can really stimulate those algal blooms, like I was saying, and they can cause a lot of problems in our system. Uh, we'll also look at total suspended solids because uh, that just kind of lets us know, you know, what's, what came into the reservoir and where is it high in suspended solids. So this is the real-time data upstream of Willow Creek Reservoir. And I just, I want to stress that this data is provisional since it is so recent. Um, the turbidity sensor at the site got installed later in June, so we, we don't see, we can't see what the effects of uh, precipitation were on turbidity earlier in the season 
But I think when you look at discharges, it's pretty interesting that we don't really see a response in discharge to precipitation uh, until about July. And, and then we start to see some, some high peaks with these precipitation events. Uh, the other thing that we can note is that whenever there is an increase in discharge, we see a peak in turbidity. And during this uh, July 22nd event, uh, one of my coworkers, Curtis Hartenstein, was up in a helicopter and captured this picture of Willow Creek Reservoir. So we can see, you know, in the data, all the sediment coming in, but also in this picture, we see just large amounts of sediment uh, coming in. So now we'll look at the grab samples at Willow Creek Dam. And the, the blue line is the data at the bottom of the reservoir and the green line is the, is the data at the surface. So for nitrate plus nitrite, we don't see much of a change um, during this early summer to later summer period. But with TKN, we really see that uh, once we see a lot of this, uh, these higher turbidity events and the sediment coming in, we see a sharp increase in TKN at the bottom and a small increase in TKN at the surface. And then for phosphorus, uh, we see a similar trend in that when there's a lot of sediment coming in, we see a steep increase in both orthophosphorus and total phosphorus at the bottom site, uh, but we don't really see an increase at the surface. And total suspended solids also tells a similar story. Um, I don't think anybody's really surprised here that with all these high turbidity peaks that we saw a sharp increase in uh, turbid or total suspended solids at the bottom of the reservoir, though the surface didn't really show any such increase. And just to give some, some context to these values, this, these high values that we saw at the end of July, um, I calculated the pre-fire maximums uh, for July uh, between 2009 and 2020 um, so that we could compare them to see what this new maximum maybe looks like. And for nitrate plus nitrite, you know, it is higher than the, the pre-fire data, but not by much. But for the rest of the parameters, um, this post-fire data point is much higher than the pre-fire maximums that we had ever seen in Willow Creek Reservoir. And as I mentioned, nutrients can stimulate algal growth. And that's exactly what we saw in Willow Creek Reservoir on July 27th. Um, this honestly really put the blue and blue-green algae for me. Uh, when we saw this, it was pretty jaw-dropping. And uh, it, yeah, it was, it was kind of astounding, but it's also kind of pretty. Um, we did, we worked with our partners, uh, especially uh, Forest Service, to uh, close the reservoir because of health reasons and safety reasons. Um, and I will say that water quality does seem to be improving. So we are working with our partners to discuss whether or not it's safe to reopen to recreation. So I mentioned this, all this with Willow Creek Reservoir, um, not just because it was really interesting with the water quality effects and the algal bloom, but also it really represents the perfect storm of fire effects for our system. Uh, Willow Creek Reservoir was never designed to be a flood control reservoir, but uh, we are kind of operating it in a way that we're keeping it at a lower elevation so that when these excess flows come in, we can at least capture a little bit more and buffer the people downstream. Uh, but since we're keeping it lower, it means that we have to send the water somewhere. And that is either to Grandview Reservoir or into Willow Creek and into the Colorado River. And so that begs the question, um, you know, where do we send this poor quality water? And so that was, you know, a big discussion we had with a lot of our partners with reclamation of, you know, what's, what's the best option here? And ultimately what we decided was to send it to Grandview Reservoir because it was a relatively small volume of water going into a very large volume of water in Granby Reservoir. Uh, so now on a bit, a bit of a brighter note, I just want to touch upon a bit of work we're doing with fire recovery. Um, we are, as I said, we're working with a lot of entities to do this. 
And uh, this, this talk has been a lot about effects on water quality, but fire recovery involves, you know, not only protecting water quality, but also addressing watershed impairments and protecting downstream structures and people. So our, our program really involves, uh, you know, sediment and debris control, erosion reduction, road and bridge protection, and flood protection. And specifically, what this has looked like what is, as I think Daniel and Stephanie both mentioned, uh, installing alert systems for flooding, performing seeding and mulching, uh, constructing sediment basins to capture it before it gets into the water, reestablishing floodplain connectivity, and installing debris booms to protect our infrastructure from incoming debris and sediment. And we also recognize that uh, due to the risks of wildfire in the West, that wildfire is very much a, a thing that we're going to have to deal with in the future. So we also are engaging in ongoing source water protection programs. Um, and this is really our goal as to how we can work together with uh, lots of stakeholders uh, to ensure that the forests are as healthy as we can help them be and also mitigate fire risk. So just to summarize, um, these troublesome fire is going to have effects on our system for many years to come. And we're already starting to see those effects this summer. Uh, we see it with the infrastructure because sediment and debris can damage infrastructure. We see it in our water quality. We've already seen it in Willow Creek Reservoir. Um, and we're continuing to monitor to, to look at our other reservoirs. Um, and then our operation decisions are really affected by this because we now have new constraints and uh, that we didn't have in past years and we have to really strategically operate so that we're not uh, causing extra damage or anything like that. Um, and then I'm just going to read this last bullet because I think it's really key. Uh, but fire effects will persist for many years and recovery is going to require collaboration, external funding, and ongoing source water protection to reduce risks to water sources. Um, that's all I have, so thank you. Thank you very much, Maggie, giving us the overview of what Northern Water is doing to, um, to mitigate some of these impacts on downstream users. I um, really appreciate your perspective. Um, next, I'd like to invite uh, Blake Osborne, Water Resource Specialist with the Colorado Water Center for the next presentation. Hello, thank you, Jessica, uh, for the introduction. And um, I realized this morning my computer might have a slight delay. So if I'm talking a little bit ahead of my slides, uh, please, I apologize for that, but I'll try to slow down and make sure that I stick with it. But yes, I'm Blake Osborne with the Colorado Water Center, uh, a hydrologist located actually in Southern Colorado. And our mission at the Water Center is to bring applied research and some outreach and education around really a variety of water topics um, that, that are facing Colorado. We've, we've been working a lot in the Colorado River Basin lately on some of the issues over there. Uh, but one of the programs that I run, that I've run now for about three or four years, I guess going on four years, is a, is a program called WAVE. And WAVE is uh, it's an acronym for the Watershed Assessment and Vulnerability Evaluations. That's kind of a mouthful, uh, but it's a program to really uh, help private landowners address the impacts of fire. Uh, you know, not all fires are created equal as we have seen today and 2020 was kind of an exceptional year, but kind of in that same line of thinking, not all fires are, are within a proximity of, of the necessary resources. And so sometimes fires uh, burn in areas where, you know, there's not a lot of, of mobility of, of agencies to respond, especially for private landowners. But one thing that we found is that with CSU, um, specifically with our partners in CSU Extension and the Colorado State Forest Service, you know, there's usually a presence in every county around the state. And so how do we kind of standardize a methodology that we can help private landowners um, that are affected by some of these fires uh, all over the state, you know, come, come up with recovery plans that are based on science and they can really tie them in with resources, uh, you know, at the state level that they may not be aware of. So that's where WAVE came in. And really, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's meant to look at land recovery um, and some things that aren't necessarily directly tied to, to hydrology or the water cycle, 
but we are, we're always looking through that hydrologic lens. So really the focus of the program is to stabilize the water cycle and look at, at flooding and erosion. And so, all right, let me see, make sure this is, uh-oh. Sorry about, okay. All right, um, I hope that slide changed for everybody. Um, basically, I'm showing a little bit of a flow chart about uh, the kind of the structure or the bones of how this program is administered. I mentioned the water center who I work for uh, is a part of this. We also work with our colleagues at the State Forest Service and CSU Extension. Typically after a fire comes through, you know, they get flooded with, with calls um, from, from landowners that have, obviously mostly never been involved with a wildfire before. There's so many new questions. Uh, and so we work together to, to, to answer those questions in a variety of ways. So WAVE was, was built out to be sort of what I like to call a pipeline of services. Uh, at its most basic, we can offer consultation with education and outreach, you know, putting people in, in, in touch with resources, um, literature, those kind of things. But really the bread and butter of the program is to actually go out onto the ground and provide uh, an assessment. And so I'll go into a little bit uh, more about what the assessment entails in a second, but it's to get out with the landowners and collect data, but really also hear their stories and collect some of that contextual data that's really important. Um, you know, there's already uh, assessments out there from different agencies, and actually we work really closely with, uh, especially the NRCS, and then sometimes, it, like in the case of the, the Cameron Peak, we'll work with local groups like Daniel's group um, to, to, to figure out what exactly the needs are, but, but actually getting out onto the land and hearing the landowners and, and finding out what their needs are uh, is really important and, and really creates a flexible assessment. And that's one thing that we've really listened to and, and have, have had success with is trying to uh, hear what their needs are, but then also bring sort of that watershed perspective and helping them to understand that, you know, maybe there's things above, above them in the watershed or upstream that uh, might impact them. Or conversely, there might be some things that, that they do or could do or, or should do on their lands that, that will help uh, further down in the water, water, watershed. So, you know, it's just trying to build that context and and that's where the assessment plays a key role. Uh, sometimes we're, we'll work with our landowners to go a little bit further than that. And uh, I love Daniel's slide of, of all the different agencies um, involved in the different aspects of post-fire because that, that's very true. And uh, you know, there's, there's state, federal, local agencies, there's nonprofits. Um, there's a lot of, of, of um, lanes, I guess, that people are in and trying to navigate that can be can be overwhelming for some landowners. So as they reach out to us, that gives us an opportunity to, to help them through that process. And uh, finally, what, what WAVE sort of aspires to do, and we've, we have been successful in some cases, and I'll share a, a case study, is, is we can actually take some of these, these recommendations and, and implement them, and then try to get some, get some data out of it, uh, do an applied research project. And again, I'll, I'll give a, an example of that a little bit later in this presentation. And so just kind of a summary of what I just said, you know, we work primarily with private landowners and really what we like to do is get out on the ground and do assessments with the goal of improving land health. And the primary goal of WAVE is, is to stabilize the water cycle uh, and, and in some ways improve that hydrologic function or at least catalyze the recovery, you know, uh, to, to uh, minimize the negative impacts and, and really support those ecosystem services that, that are so important. Uh, but we, like I said, we work with our partners in the, the Forest Service and um, an extension to possibly do other things as well, we can improve biological function, or in some cases, even there's been opportunity, opportunities to uh, expand certain things, uh, where, whereas the fire created a new opportunity. So we're, we're trying to, again, like build a, a flexible assessment that doesn't just look at one aspect of the post-fire recovery, but kind of build in, you know, the multiple avenues um, that we all work in. So within the watershed, obviously the, the goal of the wave uh, assessment is to take that watershed scale approach. And you know, really when we go in, we're focused mostly on fire, but we can't ignore all of the different disturbances that can happen uh, at the watershed scale. Some of them physical, 
uh, others biological, sometimes combinations of the two. Uh, but where Wave really makes, um, you know, its, uh, its, its impact is in this post-fire post flooding and erosion um, space. And, and I have some of this stuff, uh, it's already been covered, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of the things that we're looking for when we're out on the ground, um, looking at different treatment options. And again, uh, thank you to, to the presenters for, for teeing this up. But really, you know, when we're out on the ground looking, looking for, for uh, assessment opportunities or, or implementation opportunities with our landowners, we're dividing things into hill slope treatments and channel treatments, kind of like was, was already mentioned. So just a couple of examples of these, again, won't go in, into depth, uh, it's already been covered, but mulch is, as Stephanie said, uh, one of the best uh, implementation things that, that can be done. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to mulch, so that's one of the primary ones that we look at. Other things like, like shredding trees uh, to reduce debris flow hazards and seeding um, are some of the things that are, are, can be more common and more widely applied. Uh, and then there's some other things that are really, you know, stormwater related, uh, things that we see in cities or along roads, um, log erosion barriers, those are kind of unique to the forest, I guess, but really all serving that same purpose of trying to slow the water down. Um, you know, there's, there's some debate, um, there's some debate in the, in the literature about the efficacy of things like log erosion barriers. And, uh, and, and it's true that they don't actually capture and store a lot of sediment, um, in, 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 at least at the watershed scale, but the impact in slowing that water down, uh, again, to me, that really drove home the, the connection with stormwater, the slow it, uh, sink it, slow it, set, spread it, sink it kind of mentality. And so we see a lot of these, and then if you do want to capture more sediment, obviously silt fencing is a pretty common uh, methodology or, or implementation strategy as well. On channel, we'll do things like uh, install or recommend check dams um, or do sediment ponds. Here's an example of one we did recently. Uh, some other things are, are uh, stream bank hardening. That can be one, but um, really, you know, the, the purpose of presenting these is to kind of show the, the, the connectivity uh, or disconnect sometimes that occurs with point scale, especially in the case of like stream bank hardening, point scale action and watershed implications. As Stephanie was mentioning about how something like stream bank hardening or modifying a culvert can change the sediment dynamics or, or the velocity profile of the stream. And while that might be good for our property here, it might have a negative impact uh, somewhere else. So we wanna to try to you know, take a step back and try to help landowners understand what the impacts of taking certain actions are gonna be, not just at at the point scale or, or the hill slope scale, but, but also at the watershed scale. Oh yeah, and then just some other common uh, treatments that we might recommend. Um, roads and trails can be notoriously tricky as, as, as a place to channelize water and, and really create some, some sediment sources. So outsloping, water bars, and then culvert modification is actually one of the more common, one of the more common things that, that we have to look at and, and, and work with our partners a lot of times to, uh, to redesign or re-engineer. So um, just to take a step back, we, like I said, we go out on the land and we will talk with landowners and we'll take a series of, of measurements, we'll collect data. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what we collect in a second, but um, one of the first things that we do is we try to understand what's important to the landowners. Uh, instead of trying to come in and, and, and you know, talk about what's, what's specifically important to something that maybe they're not as interested in, uh, we try to, to bridge that gap and, and work both ways. So first we wanna know what's important to them and how can we try to support their, their needs? And then, like I said, also making them aware and sort of nudging them towards this idea of the watershed scale. Um, it's sort of the, the introductory uh, part of the WAVE program. But then we'll go out and we'll collect data, uh, depending on the needs of the land, the landowners. And there's a lot of variables that go into this. We've assessed five acre parcels um, as much and, and over 8,000 acre parcels. So the needs are often very different. Um, sometimes we'll take, uh, you know, stream channel measurements, we'll cover, you know, we'll look at infrastructure, things like that, and that'll be it. And in other cases, we really do a watershed sort of scale assessment. And um, we'll collect data like on the ground, point scale data. And then one thing that we've been doing a lot of lately is uh, deploying drones to collect data, which has just 
you know, X created a lot more opportunities for collecting more data more efficiently. And so I just wanted to highlight one of our one of one of the things that we do, which is this uh, structure from motion um, method where we go out and, and fly the drone and capture images to really then recreate uh, surface models. And um, and here's an example of that. You can see on the right, these panels are, are a series of moving images as the drone flies over uh, and the trees and, and the, the scale of the trees and the, the, the positioning changes and the perspective changes. And from that, we can then, you know, stitch, stitch some of these photos together into a giant photo, an ortho mosaic, and then, uh, and then create a digital surface model from that. And this is something that is used often in, in uh, like survey engineering. Um, and and we, we use it in a similar way. So, uh, and then we also have another application, but in this example, you know, we did the stream channel through this, through this ranch and then provided this data to, uh, to an engineering firm that, uh, that used it in their, their modeling, their HEC-RAS model. So that's one way that we can capture data. Another way is we do this sort of the same thing and we'll capture uh, this digital surface model data and then uh, fly the drone after successive rain events and um, look at hill slope erosion. And you can do like a DEM compare to see where the sources and the sinks are uh, sort of at sort of that bigger scale. So that's one example of, of some of the work that we do um, for landowners. And then to supplement that, that, that data collection, sometimes we'll, we'll even engage in modeling. So often there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of entities that will, will do modeling, CFRI, the, Col the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute was mentioned. They do a lot of sediment modeling, uh, which is great. The CWCB will, will often bring in engineers to do uh, HEC-RAS or HEC-HMS modeling. But in some cases, uh, the fires are small or um, in an area that, that may not be, gives much attention. And so we can backstop some of that with, with some of our modeling as well. And really in the end, the goal is to come up with a report, a recovery report for these landowners. And uh, that's sort of step one. So now they have sort of an idea of, okay, here's, here's the state of, of my land. And uh, here's some opportunities to restore and recover. And sort of here are the resources and the next steps to do that while also engaging with the broader sort of watershed scale community. So we'll give them a report. And then sometimes that's it. You know, they're happy. Okay, now I, I can, uh, if I have a thousand dollars and in two hours of my time, here's where I can focus. Or sometimes it can go a little bit further. And I just wanted to highlight a case study that we're working on right now with our partners at the Sea Lazy U Ranch. And also we've been uh, working closely with Northern Water and a few others to, uh, to implement and, and develop this study. But what we did is we, we did an assessment for the ranch and then identified a few areas that uh, some implementation would really help reduce the risk. So we went out and, and um, found some money. Um, thank you to our sponsors at the Water Quality Control Division. Um, for, for allowing us to do this, where we went out and implemented some BMPs, and then we're collecting water quality data uh, from these from these different BMPs. And this is on the East Troublesome Fire. If anyone knows where the Sea Lazy U Ranch is, it's it's right above Willow Creek Reservoir. So as Maggie was was talking about, uh, we're just a little bit upstream of that. You can see the ranch on the map there. And uh, just a quick overview it was all, mostly covered, but the East Troublesome Fire, large fire, fast moving fire for the most part, consumed most of the acreage. So not a really high intensity fire in most areas. Although this map has since been updated. So I'll give that disclaimer that this is not the current uh, burn severity map. I just learned that this has been updated. So, um, but still not, not an incredibly high severity fire as say compared with the Cameron Peak, but still some pockets of really high burn severity. So we found one of those and it just happened to be in a, in a catchment uh, just upstream of the ranch headquarters and decided that it would be a good idea to, to implement some different treatments. So we, we, we uh, deployed some, some uh, mulch, uh, log erosion barriers, uh, seeding, and then implemented some sediment, uh, sediment ponds, sediment control structures. And um, just a couple of photos of that. We brought students up which was great. And we set about uh, implementing some of these treatments. And then down here on the bottom right, you can see this is an example of one of our water quality uh, monitoring sites where we're taking automated samples when flow is, is at a certain depth, 
essentially after you know a certain rainfall uh, intensity or threshold that can trigger flow, we have an automated sampler that will will sample that water. And we worked with Northern to to uh, develop our parameter list. So a lot of the things that Maggie presented, uh, we're collecting those parameters and, and analyzing for those parameters. And essentially, what we're trying to do is see you know how much say orthophosphates coming off the hill, not necessarily in in the creek where where Maggie's um, team is is monitoring it, but actually coming off of these hills. So we're monitoring that after after these different rain events, and we set this up to be uh, a sort of a paired watershed study. So we have a, a small catchment where we implemented these treatments and then another one where we didn't and we're, we're comparing the two. So just sort of as a summary for that, that Sea Lazy U project, you know, we were able to treat uh, over 15 acres, which doesn't sound like a lot, uh, but where, where we did treat the areas were, were areas that we identified as, as higher risk. So we tried to make, you know, a strategic placement of these BMPs and, uh, and it is expensive to do these treatments. Um, so far, we haven't had uh, too many triggering rain events on our actual study catchment. So as, as Stephanie was alluding to, we have, there's a lot of highly localized precipitation. And while there's been some pretty big rains upstream, you know, in the basin, there hasn't been, uh, there's only been one so far that, that's triggered an event here. So we're gonna continue to collect data and see how things change in the water quality coming off the hill over time. And since then, we've been doing a lot of education and outreach to, uh, to different groups on the ranch and, uh, and the different conferences. To take a step back and kind of look at WAVE and how we plan to move forward with this, uh, WAVE, like I said, is a statewide program. So we, we've been around for about four years now and, uh, and we work all over the state with, with our different partners. Um, we have a, a plan in place for 2022 to work with, with one state agency to expand trainings to some of their workforce. Uh, but we'd like to, you know, try to bring about uh, a working group that can, that can push this, this, uh, this methodology forward and help standardize it more so that when there is a, a fire, say, in, uh, you know, the Cameron Peak area or down in the, the San Juan Mountains, you know, there's some sort of shared methodology for, for approaching this, this assessment with private landowners. Um, one thing that we didn't exactly plan, but we're working on, working really hard on, is the sociological aspect of working with private landowners after a wildfire. So while, while you know, anyone can come in with, with technical expertise and, and sort of do an assessment, um, it's, it's a really interesting exercise in understanding the the psychological dynamics of also working with private landowners. And so that's something that we're, we're working on and, and uh, have, we have room to grow in that respect. But, um, but I think that you know, one thing that makes us uh, successful is our relationships that already exist between say extension and these landowners or the forest service and these landowners. And so there, there's a level of trust there, but uh, wildfire tends to bring about different um, you know, states of mind. And so we're, we're really working hard to try to understand how to be how to be sensitive and, and understanding of, of, of those dynamics as well. Uh, publish our findings from this case study is, is something that we're going to do. And then, uh, you know, WAVE was built on the, the science that people like Dr. Camp and others are doing. So as the science evolves, uh, WAVE will continue to evolve. And we really, you know, we really rely on and, and thank the, the researchers that, that are able to, to put forth this information so that we can then take it and try to actually benefit um, private landowners. So uh, that's it for me. I'll, I will uh, hand it over to the next speaker and my, my contact information is here. So thank you. Thank you very much, Blake. Um, thank you for your overview of the WAVE program and all of the work that you're doing to help private landowners restore their lands. Thank you. Um, I'd like to now introduce Rachel Hamby, the Western Land Senior Policy Analyst for Western Resource Advocates. Rachel? All right, Jessica, do you see that? Do you hear me? Yes. All okay. right. Thank you so much, uh, Jessica, for the introduction and for organizing such a great symposium. Uh, we've had 
wonderful presentations from our other speakers. I've been learning a lot. Uh, very impressed with the symposium so far. Um, so what I'd like to do today is bring us up uh, more to the 30,000 foot level and talk a little bit about how we got ourselves into this situation, um, you know, with, uh, with uh, catastrophic wildfires being such a problem in the state all the time, and how are we going to get out of it, um, including some of the proactive steps that we can be taking to prevent catastrophic wildfires and their impacts. And specifically, I'm going to talk a bit about some of the state level policy tools that we can use or create to help uh, communities across the state improve their wildfire resilience. So, um, you know, as we think about the path forward, I think it's important to stop and evaluate how we got to where we are in the first place and what can we learn from that that can inform our future choices. You know, why is it that we're seeing these bigger and more destructive fires? Why is it fire season all the time every year now? Um, and there's a few key drivers. Uh, certainly, uh, climate change is real. As we know, um, it's hotter and drier and that makes it easier for uh, trees and other vegetation to burn. We also know that we are in a west-wide mega drought, uh, which certainly uh, isn't helping us any. Uh, we're getting um, you know, less precipitation, less snow. And when you combine that with climate change, the snow that we do get isn't sticking around as long. Uh, it's not able to uh, act as a fire break as much as we saw uh, was helpful in some of the other fires that the other speakers talked about. But we're getting less of that effect between less precipitation and climate change. Um, and then uh, less rain during the fire season to help put out um, the fires that do start. Um, and then as uh, another impact of the drought, as uh, some of the other speakers again were uh, teaching us about, the high burn severity scorching the soil so badly that rain doesn't um, soak into the ground and it just uh, runs off and creates a lot of water quality problems. So in addition to those two, uh, there's a couple of other specific um, drivers of this that I want to focus on today. Um, and it's these uh, second two. So um, the history of fire suppression that we've had in the US and particularly here in the West and uh, our pattern of building um, and continuing to develop in high risk fire areas. Um, and you know how, how these things uh, combine to lead us to where we are today and how we can uh, start to undo some of those. So starting with our uh, history of fire suppression, um, you know, as, as many of us are learning these days, fire is supposed to be a part of these forest ecosystems and it plays an important role. Um, and some species even need fire to help them uh, open up their cones and release their seeds to uh, continue the next generation of the forest. So uh, healthy forest, or uh, sorry, healthy fire is important and a good thing. It can clear up some of those built up fuels. It stays low to the ground and burns at a lower temperature. Um, so we have that low to moderate burn severity that some of the others were speaking about. And the mature trees can survive that. Um, they're, they're designed to survive that uh, low level of fire. Um, and you contrast that with a catastrophic fire, which you get when you have way too much built up fuel because uh, we've been putting out fires and not allowing natural fire to clear out those fuels. Um, those hotter and bigger fires will climb up to the top of the trees and destroy even the mature trees. And then you get that scorched earth, uh, hydrophobic soils that uh, we heard about from Daniel and Stephanie earlier. So just to um, give a bit of a picture of this, on the left, here's an image of a healthy forest, um, you know, that is that is seen periodic fire. You know, this is um, what we don't always see in Colorado, but this is, um, you know, more what um, it should look like and contrasting that with the image on the right of uh, an unhealthy forest where you have way too much uh, fuel buildup. You see some of the young trees that have, that have grown up um, towards the tops of the others. A lot of these dead trees still standing. Um, so, and then uh, again, on the left, we see uh, what a healthy fire could look like when it occurs in a healthier forest. It's staying low to the ground. It's not reaching up into the crowns of those more mature trees. And then uh, contrasting that with the image on the right of a catastrophic fire uh, that is burning uh, way too hot and uh, reaching way up into the tops of the trees and just uh, destroying everything. Um, so many of the Native American cultures uh, across the U.S. and particularly in the West uh, understood the role of fire and would set and manage fires so that they were coexisting in balance with the natural ecosystem. So uh, healthy, for, uh, healthy fire was a part of ecosystems uh, before 
uh, humans were here, and then um, you know, the many Native American cultures continued that uh, before uh, European settlement. Uh, but then we had uh, people uh, settling further and further west, um, colonizing these ecosystems, building homes and structures, um, and wanting to uh, log the forests and not see them burn. Um, and a lot of that, um, you know, prior knowledge was dismissed. And um, we started putting out any fires that started, uh, aggressively suppressing all fires. And in fact, it was even the policy of the US Forest Service that any fire that started had to be put out by 10 a.m. the next day, no matter what. So you know, we weren't seeing um, this healthy fire that was supposed to be periodically clearing out the built up fuels and keeping the forest healthy. Um, so by removing fire from these landscapes, we uh, lost the benefits of that healthy fire. And we've been doing this for about 100 years now of unnaturally suppressing fire and removing natural fire from the ecosystem, uh, which has helped to set the stage for the situation we're in now where we have too much built up fuel, which is now being exacerbated by drought and climate change, and then further accelerated by our patterns of um, acceleration of building into these high risk fire areas. So what is something that we can do about this? Um, a prescribed fire certainly is a tool that we can use to start to correct some of this history of unnaturally removing fire from the landscape. And in so many contexts, we're learning that uh, actually nature had it figured out and uh, knew what, what to do. And our best bet is uh, in many cases to try to return to that. Um, and that that's the role that prescribed fire can play, um, bringing natural fire back to these ecosystems that depend on it. Um, so there's a, a couple of um, particular benefits that prescribed fire can have. It clears out some of those excess fuels that have built up um, due to unnatural fire suppression, creates the condition for, um, you know, down the road in some instances for a natural fire regime to take back over without us uh, having to always manage it all the time. And um, it can protect communities by decreasing the likelihood of a catastrophic fire um, starting and burning and threatening uh, homes and infrastructure and other assets. And we saw this illustrated really nicely in Daniel's presentation where he showed us the burn scar from the High Park fire that presented the Cameron Peak fire from advancing beyond that area where some of those fuels had been cleared out. Um, and then uh, Daniel and Stephanie covered so nicely in their presentations the uh, water quality impacts from these catastrophic fires. So by having these uh, managed controlled fires, um, we can uh, minimize um, or uh, eliminate a lot of those water quality impacts um, by setting fires that are going to stay in that low to moderate burn severity and keeping us out of that high burn severity where we see so many of those water quality impacts. And then uh, Stephanie was teaching us so much about the impacts on infrastructure and operations. And again, staying out of that high burn severity, uh, we can protect a lot of that infrastructure and those assets and avoid a lot of those impacts and ramifications um, that we see across the entire state when we're in those uh, high burn severity catastrophic fires. So if prescribed fire is so great, why don't we see more of it in Colorado? Well, there's a few particular challenges. Um, liability for the damages, especially if a prescribed fire gets out of control, um, is definitely a deterrent. And there are very few entities who are willing to take that on um, or who could afford to cover those damages. Um, and it makes it very difficult to get insurance uh, for a prescribed burn. So um, you, you have a narrow pool of entities who are uh, willing and able to take on that liability and risk. Um, certification to be a certified burn boss, um, you know, someone who is uh, qualified to set and manage a prescribed fire, um, has been described to me as uh, our process requires brain surgeons when an EMT would be perfectly qualified. Um, and then that creates, again, a very limited pool of people who can do this work. And um, as you can imagine, they're in very high demand across the state and it limits the amount of prescribed burning that we can do just because there are so few uh, people who are certified to do it. Uh, smoke permitting is also um, an interesting one. Um, you know, there are very narrow windows where uh, the uh, ambient air quality is such that um, a prescribed burn can 
um, move forward without having uh, unacceptable air quality impacts. Um, so that permitting process can be can be difficult. And then again, the conditions have to be perfect. And there's a narrow window where everyone is going to want to do their prescribed burn because the air quality conditions are right. Um, and then again, you come back to the problem of having very few people to take advantage of those windows. And then finally, um, just doing some additional education with the public on prescribed fire and the benefits. Um, again, with our history of fire suppression, it hasn't been a part of our culture for a long time. And when people think about fire, they envision a catastrophic wildfire. And we don't have a collective vision of, you know, a, a mellow managed fire like the one that you see in this image. Um, you know, so people, when they hear prescribed fire, they think they're going to get a fire that looks like the catastrophic wildfire. Um, so some additional education of the public to uh, increase acceptance of prescribed fire and help um, you, the, the public and communities understand the benefits. Um, so apologies for a slightly text heavy slide here. I encourage you to uh, screenshot it, but we're looking at a couple of state level policies that can help uh, proactively uh, bring some more prescribed fire to the state. Um, one idea would be to create a right to burn uh, so that it's, um, it, it's more difficult for, say, an HOA to tell a landowner that they can't conduct a prescribed burn on their property um, and pair that with uh, clarifying some of the liability um, and tying that to burner certification um, so that there's an incentive for mo more folks to go through the certification process. Um, maybe making some adjustments to that process so that it is more uh, accessible to people who want to take it on. Um, again, what are some sort of uh, tweaks that we can make to the smoke per permitting process so that more um, projects can take advantage of those windows? And then, um, of course, always looking for increased funding for technical review and other support, um, as well as the public education piece that I alluded to a moment ago. So the other piece that I wanted to talk about is um, building in these high fire risk areas. You know, this is another thing that's um, that's just not helping us out. Uh, we have more and more homes and structures and other assets um, being built in these high fire risk areas. And sometimes you'll hear this referred to as the wildland urban interface or the WUI. Um, and uh, some of these numbers that I put up here, um, they're from a U.S. Forest Service analysis uh, that was done 10 years ago. And, you know, they're pretty alarming. We have almost half of Colorado housing units in high fire risk areas um, as of 2010. And uh, anyone who has uh, lived in the state anytime in the past 10 years knows how much uh, growth and population increase we've seen in the state since then. And then wanted to particularly highlight um, that 80% of the wildland urban interface in Colorado is currently undeveloped. So on the one hand, uh, this is terrifying because there's so much more potential to build in these high wildfire risk areas. But it's also a tremendous opportunity because that's a lot of future wildfire risk that we could avoid through better land use planning and steering development away from these high fire risk areas. Um, but either way, we still have a lot of existing development in the WUI that we're going to have to deal with better. Um, and I wanted to highlight these other two numbers here. Uh, so human activity um, is leading to a lot more wildfire starts. And as we talked about earlier in this session, um, between drought and climate change and fuel buildup from fire suppression, a lot more of those fires that start are able to develop into these catastrophic wildfires that that threaten homes and communities. Um, and then this perpetuates that vicious cycle of aggressive fire suppression, um, because when you have um, homes that are threatened by fire, you know, of course um, people expect that those fires are gonna be suppressed to um, you know, protect lives, which uh, you know, it's certainly no one is gonna argue with, um, to protect property and then to protect other assets. And we heard so much from Maggie about the different infrastructure that many of us rely on for our drinking water. And um, you know, we can't just let all of that go up in flames, um, but it does um, just perpetuate this cycle of fire suppression, uh, which leads to that fuels buildup. Um, so, you know, we talked earlier about uh, returning to uh, the, the natural solution here, and that, um, that doesn't necessarily work um, in this situation because we're not going to be able to just undo development that has already happened and let nature take back over. 
we can be more thoughtful about um, and strategic about how future development happens. Um, this is certainly a, a challenging policy area uh, with some, some particular um, uh, nuances here in Colorado, uh, especially. So uh, local control, um, in particular in Colorado, where local governments have a lot of power and authority, especially when it comes to land use planning. So figuring out what's the best role for the state to play in supporting communities that want to do more thoughtful land use planning um, in high fire risk areas. Um, and then, you know, there certainly is a, a culture in the state of uh, not being a fan of the top down mandate style approach that just imposes restrictions on where and how people can develop. Um, you know, that's not going to be well received by local governments or other interests. And it's something that we have to be mindful of when we're thinking through some state level policy solutions. And then finally, um, existing development patterns, um, both in the, the existing uh, framework, regulatory framework that we have in place and market preferences. Um, you know, people want the cabin in the woods, they want privacy, you know, they want to look out their window and see trees and not see other houses. And I think uh, on some level or other, we all can relate to that. Um, but again, it is um, driving this just increased uh, fire risk as we build more and more in the WUI. Um, so all that being said, there are uh, some steps that the state can take, um, especially around providing incentives or resources for communities. And again, uh, apologies for the text heavy slide and please uh, screenshot this if you're interested. Um, but a couple of things we're thinking through. So currently, uh, cities are um, required to address natural hazards in their master plans, but counties are not. Um, so seeing if, if that is something that uh, might be a solution to uh, require or encourage counties to do that. Um, developing and providing a model WUI code um, and incentives for adoption. So, um, and this might be helpful in particular for communities that maybe uh, have fewer resources and staff and just don't have the capacity to develop a model will be code, but would be interested in uh, having one or adapting it for their community. Um, we're exploring a grading system for communities um, to assess how well communities are reducing their wildfire risk um, and maybe tying that in some way to funding opportunities or other incentives um, and having a flexible menu of options so that again, uh, communities maybe with fewer resources can still have a lot of ways to um, earn points and maybe access some of those funding opportunities that they currently struggle to. Um, you know, going back to the market preferences, um, looking at a certificate program for uh, homes that have done a good job of risk mitigation. Um, exploring what uh, options there are to expand eligibility for incentive programs and making sure that entities, uh, including local governments, nonprofits, private landowners, et cetera, can access those as well. Um, and then uh, giving counties uh, more tools to regulate um, or guide how development is done um, in those counties by repealing the 35 acre subdivision exemption, which would uh, enable counties to um, uh, better work with um, developers on uh, how to plan their developments better uh, to take wildfire risk into consideration. Uh, and then finally, um, better integration between land use planning, between wildfire practitioners, um, and, you know, with, there's a lot of work going on as well about integrating water with land use planning. And, um, you know, as, as we're learning with all of this stuff, it's all connected, but exploring ways that, um, you know, the, the state through policy can uh, encourage and incentivize better integration there. Um, and then finally, funding is always a challenge. Uh, fire suppression is expensive. And when we're spending all of our money on suppression, uh, we don't have any left for some of these other efforts like prescribed fire. Um, certainly competing priorities um, in the state budget um, and public perception of where the state's money is best spent. Um, and then of course the taxpayer bill of rights um, is always a constraint on the state's ability to raise new revenue. Um, but there are some ideas here as well. Um, in Colorado, we saw a lot of progress in this most recent legislative session, um, a huge increase in funding to the forest restoration and wildfire risk mitigation grant program, as well as the Colorado Conservation Board 
watershed grant program, those booths saw significant funding increases this session. Um, and then the new Wildfire Mitigation Capacity Development Fund, which was newly created this year um, and is another grant uh, opportunity for communities. And then uh, we're looking at ideas from other states as well and seeing you know, if any of these might be adapted to Colorado. Some states are looking at a small um, insurance surcharge to create a fund uh, that might help advance more prescribed fire. Um, and then we're seeing a lot of local communities um, put questions on their ballots to uh, raise revenue for uh, county uh, fire risk mitigation efforts. So definitely some uh, ideas out there that we are continuing to explore. Um, so I am always looking to broaden and diversify the network of people that I'm talking to about all these areas. And um, one of my personal goals in presenting today was to um, make some new connections. So I very much hope that some of you will reach out to me with any uh, questions or concerns or ideas that you have about any of the policy areas that we're looking at. Um, and uh, thanks again to my fellow presenters and to Jessica for moderating the session so well. Um, and uh, again, to Northern Water for their generous sponsorship of this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel, for giving us that overview on why are we seeing, that's one of the reasons why we're seeing more fires and what we can do to make our communities be more resilient and then ways that we can fund this very expensive effort. Um, thank you all your to all the panelists um, for those wonderful presentations. It's now time for Q&A. So I'd invite all the panelists back um, so that we can open it up for questions and Sarah will be leading our Q&A. Great, thanks. Yeah, if the panelists wanna turn their videos back on so we can get as close to kind of a <laughs> in-person feeling as we can. Um, I've been keeping a running list of questions, but for the audience, feel free to uh, put those into the chat queue or you can raise your hand and we can try and um, have a little bit more of a discussion here. So I'm just going to read these in the order that they, they came in. Um, so first question, when mulching, do you start at higher elevations and work your way down? so that higher elevation flooding doesn't wash out your mulching below, or does it really not matter? I think that one came up during my presentation, Sarah, so I can hit that. Blake may have also some, some ideas or Stephanie on that as well. But yes, uh, that's a really good question. And yes, that's a, that's a great idea. If you can mulch high in the watershed, then yes, that is gonna give you kind of that headwater protection. Um, for example, in the, in the Black Hollow flood that we saw, um, a, a lot of that impact was very high in the watershed. And so, for example, if there had been mulch up there, maybe it could have slowed stuff down as it, as it went downhill. Um, it, sometimes that's tough to do. Uh, a lot of the areas where we are applying this aerial mulch um, are wilderness at the top. And so there are wilderness areas in some of these watersheds that are higher up, so you won't be able to do any kind of treatment there. Um, so you do have to do that mulch lower in the watershed. And yes, there is the potential for stuff to, to come down and, and wash that out down low. But it is, you know, the idea is kind of that top to bottom watershed approach. And so some of these areas that I was pointing to on the Poudre Canyon, uh, areas like Crown Point Gulch or Mineral Springs Gulch, the, these, you know, side canyons of maybe four or 5,000 acres that come down from the Forest Service land, down through a little bit of private property where some of these homes and structures are, and then enter the river. What we've really been trying to do is, with all of our partners, design these projects so that we've got the mulch up high, we've got the channel work and the flow work and all that stuff down low, along with the structure protection. So it really is kind of a top to bottom treatment in that sub watershed. So you're not relying on uh, the mulch to stop everything from the top, or you're not relying on the structure protection at the bottom to catch everything at the bottom. It really all has to work together. Great, thank you. Stephanie or Blake, do you have anything to chime in with there? No? Okay. Um, I think this is also directed to you, Daniel. So are the wattles with plastic netting ultimately removed from the landscape when they're no longer needed or is removal part of the overall management strategy? It is. Um, so a lot of those areas where you're doing private landowner work like that, that would be an agreement you have with the landowner. 
or with the uh, entity that implemented the treatments to come back and remove those normally after a couple of years or something like that. Some of these do take some maintenance as well. Some of the wattles that we've already put in will be going back and trying to pull some of that sediment out just to increase their uh, lifespan some. But yes, the, the wattles that we've put in, the ones that I showed you with the straw, that's ag straw, and then that is a biodegradable plastic, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that they're wrapped in. We know how biodegradable plastic plastics work. Uh, they degrade when they're in the sun. Underneath, they don't always. Um, so the plan would be to come in and, and get the rest of that stuff out of there after a couple of years. Um, some of the wattles that they make uh, these days, you can get, you know, jute wrap or something like that, that will just uh, biodegrade uh, really well. So, yep. Great, thank you. Um, and this might be for you or it could be uh, for Stephanie or Blake as well. So have you noticed any vegetation response in the mulched areas? Um, more or less emergence than similar areas that weren't mulched? Yeah, I can, I can take a stab at that. Um, so far, you know, we just finished implementation of some of our mulch treatments. So uh, it's a little preliminary. We don't actually have the, the data to support this, but one of the reasons that we're flying the drone uh, over these hill slopes is to capture that data. So we're going to look at uh, with a with an NDVI camera, looking at um, how how well these things are propagating, and then validating that with with ground ground truthing and taking like Daniel was mentioning transects and not so much transects but like Dobbin Meyer type uh, point sample collections to validate that that uh, drone data. So we are we're collecting that data, but just from observation, it, it definitely does seem to make a difference um, in capturing some of that soil moisture and uh, retaining it on the hill slopes. Again, the mulch treatments were applied to under certain parameters. So on certain slopes, um, that was kind of the big one, and then certain soil types. So there's other factors that could influence propagation, but uh, but so far, just from observation, yeah, I mean, where we're working, it has seemed to make a difference. And I think this next one is also for you, Blake. Um, is there a specific type of mulch that is used to promote post-fire vegetation? Uh, there's a variety of types. Daniel mentioned there's there's ag straw. Um, that one can be useful in certain situations. Um, then there's the, the helicopter mulch, which um, actually is just, a, it looks like something that's gone through a wood chipper. There's big pieces, there's little pieces. It's kind of a variety of sizes. And then the stuff that I used on our treatments was is called wood strand mulch. So it's 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 wood that's actually been uh, processed pretty heavily to a specific thickness about I think it was three sixteenths of an inch, and then fed through basically a paper shredder, um, and and it creates these long uh, French fry like uh, strands that uh, do a little better job of of locking together, and so it's a little more resistant to say wind and also to uh, being carried off in a in a surface sort of runoff event because it locks together. So um, yeah, there's different types of mulch and, and they each have their own purpose, I guess. Blake, I'll add to that too, that that wood strand stuff is is really cool. Um, quite expensive uh, when you're going for big acres for sure. But yeah, for some of those hand treatments and things, I, I agree. I, I haven't used it, but I've seen it. And uh, the interlocking nature of that stuff is really neat. Um, I, I like it quite a bit. Yeah, for the aerial mulch, um, to jump back to that previous question, uh, we have seen, so the idea with the aerial mulch is, you know, you're dropping a ton, ton and a half of that stuff out of the net at a time but it catches the wind and it really does disperse pretty well. You don't wanna be underneath it. Um, I don't think that would be fun, but it does disperse quite well. And you still see a lot of the vegetation, one, we're trying not to mulch areas that have a lot of already uh, good regrowth, a lot of good reveg. You're trying to miss those areas because the reveg is doing what the mulch um, would do. But the areas where we do hit green uh, vegetation, it's, it's dispersed enough that it's really not a thick coating. Um, the rule of thumb is generally about three inches is as deep as you want it anywhere uh, for vegetation to come up uh, through it. We're not getting anywhere close to that. It's really just kind of a, a covering over the landscape that's got, you know, pockets in it and that kind of thing. And we do see a lot of, uh, you know, some of these areas you see absolutely no revegetation and no regeneration of trees and that kind of thing. In other areas you do. I've seen, you know, quite a few pockets of logical pine regen and that kind of thing, and the mulch doesn't appear to be smothering those, it's kind of dispersed around it. 
Great, thank you both. Um, I think this might be geared towards Stephanie. Um, do we expect these minor streams in the Poudre watershed to stabilize in the near or medium future? Or will these impacts be long lasting and change the ecology of the watershed permanently? Yeah, good question. So the, the hill slope response tends to shut down within three-ish years, but um, the streams may continue to have some changes after that. So while there's not a lot of overland flow coming in from the hill slopes, the streams usually have a different sediment um, distribution within them and sometimes a different geomorphology. And so as that sediment gets redistributed, they might continue to change and sometimes pull some excess sediment out for further years beyond those three years of, you know, the more acute post-fire impacts. Um, they may also be producing different amounts of flow due to the loss of trees and the loss of trees taking up the, um, the moisture in the watershed. And so they may have longer um, sustained high flow for quite a few years after the fire. And sometimes if the geomorphology has changed enough, the nature of their flow and sediment regime may kind of pivot to something new. So um, again, the acute responses will probably shut down, but the streams may behave differently over the long term. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Um, this is a little bit of an open-ended question, so I would invite anybody to respond to this. Um, are there any mitigation or support groups to help municipalities or local private landowners prevent or prepare for wildfires? I can jump in on that one a little bit. Um, yes, there certainly are. And I see this question is from Crested Butte. Um, I'll start with what's going on in Northern Colorado. I, the, my last slide was about the Northern Colorado Fireshed Collaborative. And so that is kind of an umbrella organization with the Forest Service, the State Forest Service, cities, county, um, all of the watershed coalitions from the Poudre down in the Big Thompson, Estes Valley, um, Boulder County, Clear Creek, uh, all pretty much up and down the Front Range have all really come together to think about prioritizing and implementing treatments on a larger scale. And again, that's kind of how you get to that landscape scale. You can do two acres here and an acre there and that kind of thing. But when you line all those up along a certain watershed or in a an area near a community, that's where you really get those multiplied benefits. And so that's one way that the smaller groups have banded together in Northern Colorado for a larger kind of uh, landscape impact. Um, I'm thinking in Crested Butte, um, that Gunnison area, you know, there there is fire adapted Colorado, uh, which is based out of southwestern Colorado, and they're a really good resource. Uh, Becca Smolsky is the director there, and I don't have her contact information at the tip of my fingers, but she's easy to find. And you know, for your area in Crested Butte, that might be a really good place to start. And that is just a lot of the practitioners, a lot of the fire departments, the, uh, all those kinds of things get together. Used to be in person and now it's virtually and just talk about, you know, here's resources, here's a grant opportunity. These are the things we're doing. Here's some literature we've developed. Um, so there are, you know, there are groups across the state that have really ramped up um, this kind of help for private landowners and communities. Great, thanks. I did um, drop the, those two links in the chat queue as well to help direct people. Rachel or Blake, Maggie, Stephanie, anybody else have anything to add? Okay. I was going to point to oh. Fire Adapted Colorado as well. Um, great, great network. And um, if, if they're not the right organization, they'll know the direction to point you to. Great. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so these next, the last two questions that I have, and again, feel free to, to pop anything in the chat to you or raise your hand. Um, these are both for Blake. Um, so is stream bank hardening, like the photo shown, a temporary measure or permanent? Does it ever get soil covered and planted with vegetation? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and that, that more or less gets at the heart of, uh, of the questions that we ask on the assessment. So. Um, rarely do we find that there's a blanket treatment that we can apply in all situations. So stream bank hardening tends to be one of the last things that we would recommend uh, for, for different reasons. But 
if it is ever recommended, um, you know, there's rarely ever a plan <laughs> for sort of the long term, uh, either, um, you know, management or uh, the words escaping me, but, but basically to take care of these things or whether they need to be um, removed or, or left installed. So that's where we try to look not only at the short term, but also we, we maintain a relationship with these landowners that, that we can go back and do follow up assessments. And we've already done a few for say like the Decker fire a while back here around Salida. So it's sort of like an evolving um, conversation, I guess. Typically when it comes to covering them with soil or doing some, some sort of reveg, it really depends on the site. So in some cases, you know, the stream and the morphology, really it's not a good idea to do that because that sediment is likely to get <laughs> picked up in a certain flood events and, and taken downstream. Whereas in other cases, it, it, might, it might work out a little bit better. So it's really a case by case basis. But really, the, I mean, the ultimate goal is to try to reveg and, and restore those watershed processes. So, um, you know, rarely will we recommend anything that sort of has a, an artificial look to it or, or, or function. So like the, the photo I showed, I know that's a really engineered structure <laughs> with no soil or anything. And, and it, I should probably update that. But um, the goal is to restore that, that watershed function. So ideally, we'd have some sort of soil or reveg coming in at some point. Yeah, for most of these. Great. And then uh, another question about the sociological aspects. Um, hopefully over the years, Blake, you can start to show how your work with prior landowners is successful uh, with regrowth. So they trust and believe in your science. So I guess that's more of a comment. <laughs> um, and then there is one, one question that I inadvertently skipped over. So is there a recommendation to improve forest management to help minimize the potential for large fires? Yeah, I can uh, take a start at that. Um, and it looks like that question was entered uh, before my presentation on prescribed fire. So hopefully that uh, answered the question somewhat. Um, you finding ways to bring some of this natural fire back to the forest that can play the role that it's supposed to. Um, you do certainly see scenarios where you need to kind of come in and do some thinning first so that you can um, implement prescribed fire on the ground. Um, so that's that certainly is out there, um, and you know it, it gets it gets a little bit more controversial. Um, you know the the extent to which um, thinning and logging um, are helpful versus harmful, and um, uh, I, I don't have enough forestry expertise to weigh in there. But um, certainly some of the prescribed burning that we talked about, um, and you know I would come back again to being more mindful about um, how we are developing in the forest so that we're not exacerbating the risk. Um, and then certainly uh, welcome any of the other panelists to add to that. Thank you, Rachel. That, that's exactly right. I, I really enjoyed your presentation. I thought it was excellent. And that is exactly what we're trying to do uh, with the fire shed concept here in Northern Colorado is fire back on the landscape. Um, intentional fire back on the landscape is really the most effective measure. It is um, way cheaper than thinning, uh, for sure. Sometimes you do have to thin beforehand. Um, it is uh, one of those tools where you can treat large acreages at a time. And so that, that's really the gold standard. There are lots of places where prescribed fire may not make sense. And so those are areas where we are doing things like hand thinning treatments with chainsaws and piling the slash and burning the slash the next year. Those have challenges as well as far as smoke management and permitting and, and burn bus training and all the things that you mentioned in your presentation. And then the mechanical thinning treatments, you know, these are the larger scale, bigger machines. Um, what we would consider logging, although uh, let's not get ourselves, um, we don't do a lot of logging in Colorado. Uh, nobody really wants our trees. Uh, we just don't really have the industry to, um, to deal with a lot of wood products and that kind of thing, which is, you know, it's, it's kind of a backward situation. There are statistics from the uh, the co-wood program at the State Forest Service, uh, we import 90% of our pet bedding in Colorado. You know, there's some things like that that I think we could go a long way with some incentivizing of small mills and mill capacity and training in the logging industry and that kind of thing. We're never going to look like um, Oregon or British Columbia or Washington State back in the heyday of, of big clear cuts, you know, on the side of mountains. That's just not really um, 
what we've got going on in Colorado and never will. But at the same time, I, this is an interesting question and I've had a lot of discussions about this recently. This is sort of an, an aesthetics of enjoyment of the forest. Um, we've gotten in our heads that the forest dense and green is how it's supposed to be. And we have to get over that and start thinking back to how these forests used to look. They were way more open, a lot less dense. They had burned areas. The, the burn that I've been in is ugly at first. And then you start seeing all the green and all the things coming back. And, you know, it's a, it's a just refiguring the way we look at these things. We have to look at mitigated landscapes. That's with logging and, you know, with uh, cutting and burning as pleasing and enjoyable landscapes as well. We just have to change the way we see these things in order to, to set back um, the function of the forest the way they used to be. Thank you so much, Daniel. And thank you, Sarah, for um, moderating our Q&A panel. That is all the time that we have because um, we're going to go into our lunch break now. Um, but I want to say another huge thank you um, to all of our panelists for sharing their expertise today with us um, and for that fantastic introduction um, to the symposium today. You know, we this is our second virtual symposium that we've done for the Colorado Stormwater Center. And while we would love to see all of you in person, and it does have the benefit of allowing us to record this session um, and all of the remaining sessions and also invite presenters from all over the state and even out of state, which we have several presenters from out of state joining us this afternoon. Um, so I invite everyone to have a great lunch. Uh, we will start back for session two, uh, Green Infrastructure in Action at noon. And if you are wanting to get the continuing education credits um, for the, um, from the Association of Floodplain Managers, that link um, Sarah will be putting in the chat, you do need to do that quiz in order to receive those credits. So thank you all once again. See you back here at noon.